Welcome everyone to our uh, next talk at the Wool Museum, and this is uh, Bron Gondwana with uh, Two Skip, a crash safe 64 bit transactional key value store. Cool, thank you. Well, that, that's my first slide basically covered, apart from that lovely picture that I, I grabbed somewhere off the internet. There's a few pictures off the internet here to keep you guys awake because it's the middle of the afternoon on a Wednesday, and I know everyone's a little bit tired. So let's start with me. I'm Bron Gondwana. I live here in Melbourne. I'm one of the directors at Fastmail. I've been there since 2004 or so. So I've been, been working on this stuff for a little while. And for my sins, I wound up becoming a developer on the Cyrus IMAP server, which we use as kind of the core of our system um, because we had some little bits and pieces we wanted to do with it, and they expanded into bigger bits and pieces. And it's a large portion of my work these days is working on this ancient C code base. It's everything I do in Cyrus is open source. Um, sometimes I'll forget to push to the open GitHub repository exactly what we're running for a little while. But if anyone reminds me, it's there straight away. So all our stuff is open source and freely available. And most of it goes back upstream um, to the point that where we fork off for a little bit, then upstream will come back and, and take it all. Um, so we, we drive a lot of the direction of it. Um, I am named after the place next door. My parents nip back in time, obviously, from there to actually name me. But yeah, feel free to go, go and see some of my COBOL writing ancestors in the, <laughs> in the room next door after this. Fastmail has been around for quite a while. I, I joined a few years after it started. We're a hosted email service. So people pay us money. We look after their email for them. They don't have to deal with all the, the fun and games of communicating with other servers and DKIM checks. and. Yeah, we handle all that for you. You give us money. It's a great little trade-off. And we contribute a lot back to open source to the point that we've actually taken our email protocol and converted it to something that's open that we're calling JMAP. I'm hopefully doing a lightning talk about that in a couple of days, so I won't spend too long on that. Now, we got owned by Opera for a few years. Opera Software bought Fastmail, and then we bought the company back. So it's now wholly owned here in Australia. Go to that website, sign up an account. You'll see how awesome we are. Cyrus IMAP, this is what we run on our servers. A lot of user data is stored in Cyrus IMAP. It is an ancient code base. Those of you who were at LCA a few years ago would have seen Greg Banks, who was one of our developers, talking about the fun and games of trying to modernize that a little bit and get some tests in place. It's all BSD licensed, and it has a ton of custom data formats. Everyone's very cleverly composed their own little binary formats for efficiency, and it's great. But a lot of the databases are key value stores, and that's where this talk comes in. The key value store system is vaguely pluggable. It supports a few different backends, and that's Cyrus. So we have issues running a real service with lots of real servers and real hardware. Corruption. I've just stolen images off the internet, by the way. Feel free to laugh at anything you like. The first big corruption event I had was not long after I started. We lost three disks over about 12 hours from a big RAID 6 volume. Lose the first two, you find the third one started throwing errors. The whole thing switched to read only. We copied almost everything off between backups and the files that were on those disks where we recovered everything. But there weren't checksums in place to be certain that there were no corrupted blocks in those emails. So had to deal with that. Also, just you know, once a month or so, you'll get a corrupted 4,096 bytes in the middle of some file somewhere read off the volume. There are allegedly new file systems that check some stuff when they're coming off the disk, and I'm sure they're coming to Linux real soon now in a stable, usable format. Until then, we want to check this stuff in user land and be able to tell whether this is the file that we wrote right at the start. So we have SHA-1s of every single email that's stored in the index, and we can go back and compare them. We have CRC32s most places in the index formats after this lovely little bug, which um, I spent about a week if you upgraded to a 64-bit kernel around about 2626, then all of a sudden you would get random blocks of zeros appearing in the middle of MMAP reads. And it took me a week to just staring at this thing and trying to work it out to get down to a test case that would show exactly what was going on. It turned out that as you were reading along, you'd say, page in the next page. And the kernel would return and say, it's done slightly before it had actually got the data from disk into memory. So you could just read some zeros that hadn't yet been backfilled just for a moment. That was, that was lots of fun. So we wanted checksums around that as well. 
Um, and I added them to a lot of the internal binary formats, but the key value databases were pluggable things of their own. There we go. Interfaces. This is the CyrusDB interface. It's nice and simple. Yeah, isn't that a great picture? <laughs> it's a pluggable interface. Um, these slides are, are kind of wordy, but it's a basic thing where you can open a database, you can fetch a single value for each. You start with a prefix, and it will iterate over all the keys with that prefix. Very important for a lot of the stuff we do where you're doing mailbox listings, that kind of thing. You need to be able to say everything in this namespace. I want to iterate through it in order. Um, you can write, you can delete, and then it's transactional. So you can do multiple operations all at once and either commit the whole lot or abort them. That's the interface I was working with. So there it is, lib Cyrus db something.c. Each one of them is an interface to a different database. We have flat file. It's really horrible. It's quite buggy. It's used for subscriptions database, but that's about it because there's not much you can do with it. Barclay DB. I don't know if it was how Cyrus was interfacing with it or the library itself, but it was a cause of a lot of crashes, a lot of bugs for people. Still is anyone who's still running older versions of Cyrus. They get issues with the Barclay DB driver. And their documentation says don't open it with the upgrade flag because it can lose data in certain failure modes. So you can't just upgrade the data when you upgrade your operating system. And that, again, is a nightmare for people. They upgrade their operating system, the new BDB libraries, they won't open their database files. Bad. It has MySQL, Postgres, SQLite database backends, but they're not really complete for everything. So you can't use them for a lot of the core databases. And finally, it had skip list, which was buggy. Do fix it. That was really the only choice. Skip list was the only vaguely decent one. When I started Fastmail, we were getting skip list related bugs all the time. So what's a skip list, you ask? Had to put this picture in. Skipping, Melbourne style, or skipping, or skipping. <laughs> and of course, most people's mail archives look like a skip. <laughs> One thing I did discover, actually, on the internet was that there's this thing called extreme skipping and they want to make it an Olympic sport. Looks pretty impressive. But no, this is a skip list. Um, it's a data structure. This is the page from Wikipedia. There's a whole heap of information there if you want to find out more about how skip lists work. Just to talk you roughly through it, at the bottom there, it's a linked list. So each node is in order, and you start at the start, you work through, and then there's a nil pointer at the end to say there's, there's nothing after this. But Operations on a linked list are ON. If you want to find a particular item in the list, you need to scan through. Unlike with an array where you can binary search into the middle of it, with a linked list, you've got no way to get to the middle. So what a skip list does is it actually randomly chooses a level for a particular node, and then it creates shorter linked lists at the higher levels that are also sorted. So if you wanted to find item number seven, you would start. Does the video follow me? That's right. Start at the top there, and you'd scan across and say, no, there's nothing here. Then you'd go down a level. You'd read a link to number four, and you'd say it's after four. You'd read to six. It's after six. Nothing else at this level. Drop down a level. You'd read across to nine. Say that's after where I'm looking for. Drop down again. Read across. You found seven. If you're looking for six and a half, you'd read there. You'd read six, read seven. There's nothing in between at the lowest level. It must not be there. And that, over a big enough database, is auto log in. It's the same as the B tree or as binary search on an array. But it allows you to quite cheaply add a new node because you're randomly picking a level. It's kind of opportunistically close to a perfect binary search rather than totally perfect. But it works really nicely. So that's the skip list. And in Cyrus, the skip list was implemented as a flat file. And the way the flat file works is it has a header at the start and then it has what's called a dummy record, which is the blank record that contains all those first set of pointers right at the start that point in at the different levels. And then after that, there was a section called in order, which was individual add records, but with a different type to say these ones are absolutely sorted. And then anything after that, it would append a new record and go back and fix up the pointers in the original file. So this is the, the key value format. There are a couple of nice little issues with it. To read across, you needed to read the type to figure out what it was, read the key length, skip past that, read the value length, skip past that, 
and then you could get the pointers to move onwards. So there's little inefficiencies there, and this minus one pointer. Rather than knowing what the level was up front, you would count how many pointers you got till you got to minus one. There were some issues with this thing. Locking. I don't know how many people understand how flock and fcontrol and opening file descriptors work on operating systems. I certainly didn't understand how they work in POSIX when I started dealing with this thing. And obviously, whoever wrote this thing in the first place didn't either. Because if you open the same database twice within the same file, you would go and grab a read lock on it, but the other one already had a write lock on it, and you would downgrade that lock. And then you would release that lock, and then you would start writing, thinking, oh, I've still got the lock, and write randomly over someone else's copy of the database, and major corruption there. And then when you read that back, you'd get seg faults because everything in Cyrus IMAP was designed to mmap the whole file, read some offsets with a macro that expands that against the database base pointer to give you a random offset within the mmap and then read straight from that piece of memory. And of course, if you've got a corrupted file, it'll have pointers pointing all over the place outside your mmap. And you can read or even write to random bits of memory. Yay. Issues with type sizes as we upgraded from 16-bit to 32-bit to 64-bit computers. And they just used int rather than specific size types. There were some nice, fun issues there. So we have this script called Monitor Cyrus. It still runs today in production on Fastmail. It scans the Cyrus IMAP log, log files, and it looks for anything exciting that was happening. And most of the things it was finding were, this skip list database has corruption at this offset. And it would then read the hex offset, and it would convert that into a decimal offset, and it would truncate the file at that size, because that was the only way to recover quickly and keep working. <laughs> yes, that's production, that is. Um, <laughs> it still watches, and it, it emails us or pages us if it sees particular craziness happening. Um, but Monotosaurus, Monotosaurus was awesome. I fixed a lot of these through Cyrus 2.3. Um, Using CVS, as we had at the time, so I had a CVS checkout, which I would then apply a quilt patch series on top of. Yay for, we use Git now. It's so much better. Uh, fun times. But there were some things that you could not fix about skip list. All these fixes were without making any changes to the on-disk file format. I just said, right, with what we've got on disk, how much better can we make it? And got to the point that it was fairly good, but the 32-bit file size limit was starting to hit us because around about this time, we decided we needed to add conversation support. The idea that you have threading across multiple folders, and you can see this message and all the related messages, including what you've sent, in one easy fetch. And that involved a whole separate database. We used a key value database for it, skip list conversations DB. And they got to hundreds of megabytes of size for really big accounts. And if your server had crashed, then it would have to go through and check the consistency of all the pointers. And the skip list way of doing that had to actually rewrite the back pointers all the way through. It sometimes took half an hour for a user's account to be available after a restart. And I did what I could to fix that. With a clean shutdown, we actually touched a skip stamp file that said everything was shut down cleanly. All your skip lists will be clean. You can just load them back up again. But without that, it would say, this file hasn't been read since the server was started up, I've got to double check for consistency first. And the rebuilds were very slow. I wrote skip list two, which fixed some of the issues in there, but it didn't solve that crash problem. You can't trust the write ordering on an arbitrary file system and say, this write happened before this write. Unless you f-sync, there's no guarantee that the thing you wrote later won't be on disk with the thing you wrote earlier not there. So that, that's a lot of knots in that, sorry. You can write the early thing, that doesn't make it to disk. You write something later that does make it to disk. Your ordering's completely broken. You have to scan everything and double check. I also wanted to add checksums to the file and added support for all of that. But I had some goals, and I wrote them down, because that helps you decide if there's anything out there that can do what you want. Had to be 64-bit throughout. Had to have checksums on everything in the file, because we'd had those corruption problems. There'll no doubt be other ones in the future. We want to do integrity checks in the application where you know whether it's correct. Or even if you have buggy software that's written bogus databases, you need to check that. I really want it to be a single on-disk file. This is not an absolute requirement of the system, but it makes things a whole lot easier if you're just writing to one file 
and you can grab that file and check stuff against it and back it up and know it's complete and correct. It had to be fully embedded within each SAR assignment process. We don't want anything sharing memory, don't want anything other than just communicating through the file control locks and file open, file close. There's no separate locking anything, it's just that one file. Wanted to be able to read it without having to write to the file so that you could have multiple readers all at once and, and know that the file wasn't changing underneath you. But I was willing to require that writing a single 512 byte block either fully writes or fully doesn't. That's pretty much guaranteed with all the hardware that you can actually get these days. Without that, you're kind of in a mess. If you can write half a number to disk and, and the other half doesn't get written down, then there's no way you can know anything at all. What you're reading from disk will be completely random after a crash. And I figured that's a reasonable requirement. And requiring that F-Sync actually does work. If you issue an F-Sync and get back a yes, this succeeded, then anything you write after that is guaranteed to happen later. Even if your disk dies in such a way that it said, yes, I've got F-Sync and hasn't, at least it won't say, yes, I have synced and then write your later things and not your earlier things. That's, that was kind of the core requirement there. Um, so I wrote a key value database in 2011. My own one from scratch, kind of from scratch, but based on, yes, I found this. I searched for not invented here, and, and as you can see, everyone thinks it's a bad idea for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> so here it is, the database format for 2Skip. Um, it's got the header and the dummy still, because you need that. You need some place to store all your pointers for your offsets into the file, and then just the records, which are either record, delete, or commit, nothing else. A record file, slightly different. We've got the header there, and then key length and value length, which I'll talk about in a second, and then your pointers. The header includes the level, your number of pointers are there, and then a CRC32 of that block, and then your key and your value afterwards, and a CRC32 of that, plus some padding if necessary, to make everything 64-bit aligned. This is the header, it's got the type, of which there are only three, they're just a character. Level, we support up to level 20, which gives you two to the 20 records before you're likely to, to lose your ON. And at that scale, I think that's reasonable. You could easily make it bigger just by compiling in a constant. But that's how many dummy pointers there will be. Because you can't know in advance how big your database is going to get before you can repack it, you need to have lots of zero pointers just so that you can add a level 10 or a level 15 record somewhere in your linked list when your database gets really big. 16-bit key length, 32-bit value length, but if they are max, you, you in 16 max or you in 32 max, then we add a whole 64-bit length. So you can have 64-bit keys, 64-bit values without wasting the space for that. Generally, it's just a 64-bit header, a pair of pointers, and then the CRC32, so the shortest possible record is 24 bytes. Reasonably efficient. The 2skip header has a dirty flag in it to say this file is currently in flux. And I'll talk about that in a second. It has the file size at its last commit so you can calculate how dirty the file is and the predicted size after a next repack. So it keeps track of how much stuff has been deleted out of the file. The way that this file does repack is it just locks the world, scans through, writes a new file, overwrites, renames it over the original. Um, and it stores a generation number. Each time it does that repack, it increases the generation number. So if you have an offset into the file, you can double check, has the file size changed? Has the generation number changed? No, then it's an identical file. I can just read off from here and not have to recalculate my spot, which is quite important for efficiency. The whole goal here was to be able to safely make changes to this file and guarantee that they'd succeeded. 2skip is not the fastest database in the world. In fact, it's quite slow, but it's very consistent. And after a crash, instead of taking half an hour, it takes a second or two to rebuild the database, re-enable the account. So you append the data, you update the pointers, and then it commit. You rewrite the header with the new length, and you turn the dirty off. Yay. I figured. I was told, you've got to have funny pictures in here to keep you guys awake, there's a safety cat. All right, every single commit has three F-syncs to make this work. You mark the, dirt or, the header as dirty and you F-sync. That's all you do, no other changes. You say, this file is now 
unsafe. You're going to have to double check that it's consistent if you want to do anything with it. And you F-sync it. So that's guaranteed to be on disk. Then you can start appending and updating your pointers. Once you've made all the changes you want, you F-sync again. The file is still dirty at this point. And then you do one final, very small write saying to the, the header, this file is no longer dirty, and you F-sync that. Basically, between that point and that point, it can crash, and it may or may not be clean. You don't know. But if it says it's dirty, you can still scan through and say it's all consistent and mark it clean. Any point before that, if it crashes, you scan through, notice it's not consistent. You can reset it back to its previous length, and it just rolls back the transaction you're in. This is actually fast enough that two skips abort command is just a, oh, look, I opened a dirty file. Let's go through and clean it, because it's exactly the same code path. Just reads the whole thing for anything that's been damaged and cleans it up. You could do what skip list did, which was step back from the end of the file and look at all the transactions that it applied and go and rewrite, basically track down what had been done and try and revert them. Um, it cost about the same in practice because a recovery only needs to touch the records that have actually been changed. So rewrite the header, f-sync. Append data, commit, f-sync. Rewrite clean, f-sync. But a host crash during the append with skip list format, even having done all of this, the pointers could still point past the end of file. And you have to scan through the entire file and rebuild in order. because. At the start, everything's A, B, C, nice and neat ordered. But if you go back and rewrite a record or insert something in between, it will be at the end. And the point is bounce to the end and then bounce back to the next record afterwards. So you can sort of hop around inside a, a skip list file that's had a lot of changes. And if one of these pointers is broken, you're just going to have to read the whole thing and rebuild it from scratch. That was the expensive bit that we wanted to avoid doing. So here's what, why 2skip is called 2skip and what I did to fix it. Rather than having a single linked list at the bottom layer, it actually has two completely separate linked lists that link all those bottom records together. And so these two pointers, which I'll show you a little bit later in, a, in an actual real file, one of them points to the current position and the other one points to the previous position. So within any one transaction, you'll either write the old pointer and kind of this is the red blue, the, um, blue-green deploy stuff that people were talking about the other day, I guess, that you, you update one, leaving the, the good one. And then after you've committed, you can update the old good one, and that becomes the new good one. So there's always a path through at the lowest level that will be unbroken if your transaction corrupts. For the read algorithm, you use the highest value, which isn't past the length field from the header. So even if the database has crashed partway through and it points to something that never got written, there'll be another pointer that points to the correct place in the old transaction. And for the repair, you just walk through, do a for each over the whole database, wipe out any pointers that point to the wrong place, and then keep track of your back pointers and update them, which means that all you're doing, if you've made one change in that whole database and it crashed, you scan through like a for each, which is fairly quick. It does have to touch all the, the key pointers, but it doesn't have to read any of the values or check the CRCs on those. You can see immediately which pointers pointed to the wrong place, zero them out, truncate the file at the end, you're clean. So that's 2skip, pretty much. Safety dog is also happy. Let's have a look at some code or some database dumps. Can you read that? Cool. It's mostly zeros. <laughs> So up the top there, that first one, that's just the dummy record. It's got the two values, one directly above the other. They're your two zero pointers. And then everything after that's the higher level pointers. So that was the dummy with nothing written. We then write a record that just has a key of A and a value of A. And you'll see here that record's been appended, offset 150. That's hex, I'm pretty sure. Um, and it's updated, because this is only a level one, or level, this is level two, sorry. It's updated one of the zero pointers and one at the, or level one pointers and one at level two. So they're both pointing to that offset. Okay, moving along. Oh yeah, 
I put this slide back in just so I could show you again here. It's updated two pointers because it's a level two and all the rest was still zero because they're pointing straight to the nil. And then the end pointers on that record, you can see they're all nils. The, there's nothing after this A in this one value database. So moving along, we've then added a record B and we've overwritten record A with a new value. So record B pointers got updated and then record A got written in and it's replaced the old one. And you can see the old 150 pointer is still there because that was the old pointer to the first record. But there's now a bigger one to 1E0, which is this new record, which is the first record in the database. And from there, that then has the pointers on at level two to B and the rest of the pointers go nowhere because there's nothing after it at those higher levels. At level four, there's only one record. Level three, there's only one record. Level two, there's B as well. So it skips onto there and then off, off to the end. The red lines are basically things that are deleted once this transaction commits. But if halfway through that, we'd crashed, there'd still be that pointer to 150 right at the start. We could read through, find that, fix up all the old pointers. There we go. So now I've added C as well, and the only thing that's gone away is that commit. It's updated the pointer there to skip right through because that's a level three. It's updated the pointer in the A record at level three, and it's updated the pointers after B to say there's another record after you at level one and level two as well. And then finally, text getting a bit small, sorry. I added an AA between A and B. And in this case, A had some new pointers added to point to this, and then that points on to B. So it's been stitched into the list afterwards. And the only things that had to be rewritten, this got appended, and it had to go back and rewrite those two pointers in one record. So when you insert something, it basically cuts all the pointers that were going across, inserts itself in the middle, so it has to write forward the values for the record after it at each level and it has to go back to all the records before it at, all, at its height and update all the pointers in them. So that's what it looks like. Excuse my very crappy writing. The dummy at the start, pointers going off to null and then there are four pointers from the dummy all pointing to A because that's the first record. Two pointers in A onto AA, one pointer in A straight to C, and one off to nowhere, and then B comes straight through to C. I don't have any level one records in this particular example, because that's what I had. Anyway, source code is of course all online. It's in the Cyrus IMAPD repository. I had grand plans of forking it off in a library all by itself. It does depend on quite a few of Cyrus's internal libraries, which is why I haven't done it yet. It uses buffer string management stuff that's internal to Cyrus and malloc stuff that's internal to Cyrus. It wouldn't be that much work to separate it out as a standalone database if anyone else thought it was worth having. It's BSD licensed, it's a couple of thousand lines of C and it is reasonably easy to rewrite. The data structures are all quite simple. The F-syncs make it very reliable. Unless you either deliberately corrupt a file or you have a file system that doesn't give you those basic guarantees, then this database format won't corrupt. Um, and it's been running in production for four or five years now with quite a lot of large databases um, and occasionally some pretty nasty crashing and corrupting servers. We've got a great story of rolling out something that was just missing one comma and every single process dumped core all at once and filled up all our SSDs. Lots of things corrupted, these files didn't. They're very, very hard to corrupt. So questions? Yes. Um, I hope I didn't miss, miss any of the answer to this, but uh, why did you have the third F sync instead of simply had Mark include that right hook with the clean out and just sync once and you've got the update clock now on the clean and you just get two F syncs? Yep. So let's go back to that slide. Uh, is this a rotational testing? 
Yep, and then I'm going to go through. The question was, why do you have three f-syncs rather than just two f-syncs? So the first f-sync is necessary so that the file's dirty, um, and you know that it's not. The second f-sync is necessary because otherwise you could rewrite the header and say it's not dirty anymore, but the stuff that you've added to the file hasn't been committed to disk yet. And so you could wind up reading a file that says, I'm not dirty, but it actually is dirty. So you have, have to have that second f-sync before you rewrite the header as clean. The third f-sync, on the other hand, you don't really have to write. You can just say it's clean, and you don't have to f-sync the third time. But if you don't f-sync that third time before you return to the user and say your transaction's committed, then that the code might have actually sent something across the wire saying, yes, your message has been added to our database. If you crash right at that point and you haven't rewritten it as clean, then the code will truncate back to the old pointer and just throw away what you've appended, because it will say this is dirty. What's added is not guaranteed to, to actually be complete. So that's why the third f-sync. It's so that the reply to the user actually has a guarantee this has been synced down to disk. So you found that bytes were being reordered even for the same file? They can be. There's no guarantee. POSIX doesn't guarantee that they won't be. Um, we didn't find it, but we wanted to make sure it wasn't a possibility. Did I, sorry, did I answer your question sufficiently there? I'm getting there. Cool. OK. Yes? And the only fun with disks that are either 4K native rather than 512 native or that do track write? Uh, we haven't noticed. Again, performance isn't the big deal. So if it's 4K native, you're writing down more than just the 512. 512 was the guarantee that I required. If it's more, then you know, no problem. What about track writes? Have you seen any issues with once the drive that will read a track in, modify it, and then write back out? Again, that's only performance. Yeah, really. It won't, it, unless you can, unless it will write out. It's a power fail in the middle of a write. Yeah, but so long, so long as the single 512 gets written, if, it, if the power fail in the middle of the write breaks halfway through writing a pointer, mm -hmm. or more to the point, halfway through writing the header such that the length of the file and the dirty flag, one of them gets written but the other doesn't, yeah. then we could actually lose data. Those things are right next to each other. It would have to be a, a 128 bits split. Um, I can't see how you could avoid corruption in that case. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes? OK, sorry. If you, if you missed that question, the, the main question is, what about drives that have really weird behaviors like track writes or larger blocks than just 512 bytes? How does that affect things? As so long as the same bytes are being written down over a larger area, it doesn't matter. If we fail during that small block that is the area where the dirty flag and the length of the file in the header are next to each other, or actually if we fail anywhere in rewriting the header because we rewrite the checksum for the header as part of it, then we will wind up with a file that claims to be corrupted, um, and indeed is corrupted. So if you can't guarantee rewriting the header cleanly, then yeah. But there's nothing you can do about that. So we're doing the best that we can in that circumstance. Uh, think here first. Um, you mentioned that like, I think one of your requirements was that you wanted, like, in rewriting this, that you wanted a really fast um, time to come back up after a crash. Is that what one of the key things, say, that gives you an advantage of this versus, say, Yeah, so the question was, why not something like Redis was, was the reason for the fast recovery after crashes? The reason for not something like Redis is it doesn't give you that single file embedded database. Redis is a whole separate engine that would need to be run. It's a, a much bigger management over, overhead than just another single file database like all the ones within Cyrus. LMDB was one I looked at, but it had some bad crash recovery behavior um, according to the documentation, so I stopped looking there. Um, and there was nothing else out there that really did it. The fast recovery is the key thing. Your servers come down, it needs to come back up again, users need to get to their email. If it takes two or three seconds, that's fine. If it takes half an hour, then you've got real problems. So it was about consistent performance, including crash recovery, rather than being the fastest. This is nowhere near the fastest database out there in, in any way, shape, or form. I've got a question here next. Um, yeah, look, I was just asking uh, the Cyrus IMAP API, or sorry, Cyrus Satellite API, looks quite simple. Why are all the other drivers such a red hot mess? 
Okay, Cyrus database looks quite simple. Why do all the other drivers have problems? So looking back at, um, I'm being polite about that. Uh, um, looking back at the API here, uh, happy, happy pictures. Yeah, open, fetch, scan across things, store and delete, commit and abort. It's pretty simple. Flat file's awful because it's shit code. Thank you. <laughs> um, it's really just bad code. And it's really hard to do the flat file as well. If you insert a new record in there, it has to seek to find the right location and then work out exactly where the start and end are and take the old bit and the new bit and copy them to a new file with your stuff in between and then overwrite the old one. That's how it does it. Um, and likewise for deletes. It's a lot more I.O. than anything else and it's just painfully bad code. For BarclayDB, the problem really partly was the environment, that if a single process crashed, then it corrupted the environment. You had to restart the whole server. Partly it was that their upgrade story is just awful dump all your databases and restore all your databases. That's not particularly friendly for anything, particularly when you're doing an operating system upgrade and the operating system has to remember how to have dumped with the old version before it can load with the new version. Um, MySQL, SQLite, Postgres, the main problem with them is that they are out of process things that you're talking to. SQLite has some fun with locking unless you take a single writer thread, which would, involves taking a separate lock file basically. And for MySQL and Postgres, it's that they haven't been written for the whole for each handling in mind. The for each API looks deceptively simple, but it actually takes two callbacks for each P, which gets called within the transaction. So you lock the database and you call that to say, is this a candidate that I want to examine in more detail? You then release the lock and you call for each CB, the callback, with an unlocked database and the key and value. And it has to copy those if it wants to do anything with them before it writes back to that same database because the value could be invalidated if you wind up closing the database and reopening it because of a generation change under repack. So it has to copy those things straight away if it cares about them and then it can go and do its own thing. So that was a bit tricky with an external connection to a separate database. Um, it doesn't really handle the four inch semantics quite right. So it's good for single key value lookups, but for for each, it's messy. And the list code is a bunch of for each's over different namespaces. It's quite complex. Yep, cool. There was a question, I think um, Paul was next. Sorry? Yeah. Um, you kind of answered this a bit with one of the other questions, but I was going to say, could you summarize the trade-offs between Swift and other uh, with SkyScript? Cool. The question was, could I summarize the trade-offs between 2Skip and other things like BDB? To skip is the file format is one simple flat file and you can grab a copy of it. Even if you grabbed a copy while it was being changed, you're still guaranteed to have something that you can run recovery on and get the previous transaction out cleanly. Um, so it's very easy to back up. It's very consistent. The trade-off is that it's slow. It's quite slow compared to databases that are optimized around speed, raw speed rather than consistency. It is slower for reads because it does CRC checks all over the place, basically. Um, but it's auto log in for lookups. Um, the for each is quite good. And because the code is better, um, performance is, is roughly similar to skip list for a lot of common use cases, just because even though skip list is slightly more efficient without all the checksums, it's a bit more wasteful of space and you need to scan right through all the key and value to find the pointers at the end rather than being right at the front. Yes? What are the main two? How many items do you have in one skip list? Just go into the uh, Probably the question was order of magnitude, how much stuff would you have in one skip list database? The conversations databases tend to have up to about half a million items in a single database and there will be you know, 10,000 of these on the server being opened and closed all the time. When it opens it, it M maps the whole file at the start, but obviously that's not very expensive because it just pages in the bits that it needs. Um, yeah. Cool, there are a couple more questions floating around. Yes? I was just wondering when you were looking at um, the other solutions, did you check out the Taylor's name and just about that during the race? So key values, different stories, is that a 
I can't remember what the issue with Celucene was. I think it required multiple files. It okay. wasn't just a single file, so that was the reason that, okay. that I decided against Celucene. Five minutes, thank you. Anyone else? We've got a couple of moments, so I will just show you it in action, if I can get my mouse point over there. So this is the file with stuff in it. Um, and you can do all the operations on it. Set, delete, etc. Um, DB tool is just a simple wrapper around stuff, and then you can dump it, and you can see that record A was there, and then I replaced it with the same thing, and it created a new A, which again has pointed off to nowhere, and because my screen is so ridiculously large there, um, you can see the dummy record's been rewritten with the offsets 190 and 150 to the old thing, which is just what I showed you before, but if anyone has anything they want me to do fancy with this, I can do that in the next couple of minutes. It's a tunable value in oh, okay. the file, the calculation of, of what percentage of the file it considers dirty before you decide to repack. So yeah, the question was what decides when you repack? Um, two things, there needs to be at least a certain amount of dirty. If there's only 10 bytes of dirty, then no matter what percentage size of the file is, it won't repack. And other than that, it's a percentage of the file that's dirty, it will decide to repack. Um, and it does that at the end of a transaction. Yes? Uh, mostly for ease of management and, and ease of being able to check that the file was there. We, there's code in Cyrus now. So the question was, why do you only want one file? Uh, it's mostly for ease of management, ease of backing it up, um, and ease of seeing what's going on. Um, otherwise, you'd basically have to put each thing in a directory for that database file or, or deal with all the fun things that can happen with multiple files and the need to f-sync the directory that they're in and fun things like that. Um, which if a whole database engine that handled that might have been okay, but there was nothing that really gave the consistency guarantees that I wanted at the time. I haven't gone back and looked since because this is working fine in production. <laughs> and that's, that's, there's a lot of value in that. So you go, ho hopefully nobody knows anything about POSIX that says I'm wrong about the guarantees <laughs> I'm expecting because Yes, <laughs> that's okay because everyone else is too. <laughs> all right, well, if, if that's all, thank you, everybody. I um, hope you maybe learned something. And if not, well, hope you had fun. <laughs> <laughs>